Welcome back. In this lecture we're going to be looking at the SQL system topology and how to create a queue so you can start submitting work to a device. In this lecture we're going to cover the SQL system topology and how to traverse it, how to query information about a platform or a device within the topology, how to select a device both manually and using device selectors, how to configure a queue, and then finally the SQL scheduler and how to submit work. First of all, let's take a look at the SQL system topology and how it's structured. A SQL application can execute work across a range of different heterogeneous devices. And the devices that are available in any given system are determined at runtime when you do topology discovery. When querying the topology of a SQL system, there will be a number of platforms available. Each platform is an implementation of a particular backend. For example, an OpenCL backend for Intel and an OpenCL backend for NVIDIA are different platforms. This is an important distinction because platforms can generally not communicate directly with each other, and we'll see this come up in a later lecture when we cover data movement. Each platform will also have a number of devices associated with it. These can be CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, or any other kind of accelerator. In SQL there is also a host device, which executes SQL kernel functions natively within the SQL runtime. The host device emulates the execution model and memory model of a regular SQL device. This can be very useful for debugging SQL applications, as some devices may not have native debugging tools available. There is always one host device, each SQL implementation must have one, and there can only be one. The host device is also associated with the host platform, and again there can only ever be one host platform. Platforms and devices are represented by the platform and device classes respectively. A default constructed platform object creates a host platform and a default constructed device object creates a host device. Now there are two ways in SQL to traverse the topology of a system. Firstly, there are APIs which allow you to manually query the available platforms and devices. Secondly, there is a mechanism called device selectors for automatically traversing the system and producing a device based on a heuristic for scoring devices. First we're going to take a look at how you would manually traverse the topology of a system. The platform class provides a static member function called getPlatforms. This returns a vector of all the platforms available in the system, including the host platform. So in this example where we have two OpenCL platforms and a host platform, getPlatforms would return all three of these. The platform class also provides a member function called getDevices. This returns a vector of all the devices associated with a specific platform, including the host device. So in this example, where the Intel OpenCL platform has a CPU device and a GPU device, if you were to call getDevices on the Intel OpenCL platform, it would return both of these devices. Alternatively, the device class also provides a static member function called getDevices. This returns a vector of all the devices available in the system for all platforms. Again, this includes the host device. So in this example, where we have four devices across our three platforms, get devices we return all four of these. Next, we're going to look at how to traverse the topology using device selectors. To simplify the process of traversing the topology and selecting a device, SQL provides the device selector mechanism. A device selector is a function object which inherits from the device selector class. A device selector provides a heuristic for scoring devices. SQL provides a number of standard device selectors, but users can also create their own custom ones. The device selector class provides the member function select device, which will traverse the topology for every available device, pass each of them through the device selector, obtaining a score for each, and then it will choose the device with the highest score. Any device with a negative score will never be chosen. Here we have an example of constructing a device selector and calling the select device function to retrieve the resulting device object. The default selector is one of the standard device selector types provided by SQL. The default selector will choose a device based on an implementation defined heuristic, so the device that is chosen by this can vary from one implementation to another. Okay, so now that we know what a device selector is, how do we create one of our own? So it's actually pretty straightforward. A device selector must inherit from the device selector class, and a device selector must provide a function call operator which takes a reference to a device object and returns an integer. 
The body of that function call operator is the logic which defines the heuristic of your device selector. This is how you define how each device is scored, and the value returned is the score for the device that is passed in. In this example, we return a positive score for each GPU device and a negative score for everything else. However, this logic could be much more complex, querying the vendor or the capabilities of the device. If you end up with more than one device with the same score, then the one that is chosen is implementation defined. Now that we have our device selector, to use it we can simply pass it to the constructor of the queue, and this will create a queue which will enqueue with the resulting device. There are a number of other ways to configure a queue, and we'll touch on some of these later in this lecture, but this is the most common. Now we've covered how to create a device selector, but how do you decide what to score each device? So in the body of your device selector's function call operator, you can query the device or its platform for information about it to determine its score, depending on the heuristic that you want to define. You can do this by calling the getInfo member function template, providing one of the many enum values corresponding to different pieces of information that you can query. You can retrieve the platform associated with any device by calling the getPlatform member function. Here we show some of the information that you can query, but for a full list of these queries you should see the SQL 1.2.1 specification or reference cards. So now we're going to take a look at what a queue is and what it does. But first, before going into what a queue is, it's first important to understand what a context is. A context in SQL is an object which manages the underlying resources of a platform and a number of devices. A context can represent one or more device, but they must all be associated with the same platform. So in this example, we've created a context for the Intel OpenCL platform and both its devices. Now a queue in SQL is the object which is used to submit work. There are many ways to configure a queue in a SQL application, from the very simple to the more complex, but every application must have one. A queue's job is to process command groups and submit commands to the scheduler for a particular context and device. A SQL application will often want to target multiple devices. This can be useful for task level parallelism and load balancing. Here we have two queues, one for the CPU and one for the GPU, both associated with the same context. This is important for being able to communicate efficiently between the two devices. So how do you create a queue? There are a number of ways to do this, some involving more complex configurations of contexts, but in this lecture we're just going to focus on the most common. The simplest way is to default construct a queue, which will use the default selector. This will create a queue which is associated with the device that is selected by the default selector and will implicitly create a context for it and all other devices associated with the same platform. So in this example, if we assume that the default selector chooses the Intel GPU device, then we will create a queue for the Intel OpenCL GPU which has an implicit context which is associated with that device and the Intel OpenCL CPU as well. Next, as we've seen in earlier examples, you can construct a queue from a device selector. This will create a queue which is associated with the device that is chosen by that device selector and implicitly create a context, just as before. So in this example, we end up with the same result, but here we explicitly request an Intel GPU. So now that we have a queue, how do we submit work to it? In SQL, all work is submitted to a queue. This is done by using the submit member function. This will process a command group and submit commands to the SQL scheduler for the context and device associated with that queue. So here we submit a command group to the GPU queue where it is then processed and submitted to the scheduler. Then once the scheduler decides to execute those commands they are then enqueued to the target device. The same scheduler is used for all queues in order to share dependency information and maintain a single ordering of commands. So in this case, where we have two command groups submitted to different queues, each queue will process their respective command groups and submit them to the scheduler. The scheduler will then decide the ordering of the commands in each command group based on the dependencies of each, and then enqueue the commands to the target devices in that order. The submit member function takes a callable which can be either a function object or a lambda expression. 
the callable must take as its parameter a reference to a handler object. The handler is created by the Ziggo runtime and passed into the callable by the submit member function. So you cannot manually create a handler. The body of the callable represents the command group scope. This is where you construct a command group. And you do this by associating dependencies and commands with the handler object. But we'll cover this in more detail in later lectures. The command group scope is called exactly once. And when this function returns, the submit member function will then construct a command group. This command group is then processed and submitted to the scheduler, where its commands are enqueued asynchronously. A queue object will not automatically wait for submitted work to complete when it's destroyed. There are other ways to wait for work to complete if you have data dependencies, and we will cover this in a later lecture, but it can also be useful to explicitly wait on the queue to complete any outstanding work. You can do this by calling the queue's wait member function. Okay, now that we have covered how to submit work to a queue, it's important to now understand how to handle any errors that might occur. In SQL, errors are handled by throwing exceptions. And it's crucial that these errors are handled, as otherwise your application may fail silently. In SQL, there are two main kinds of errors. Synchronous errors, which are thrown directly to the user thread, and asynchronous errors, which are thrown by the SQL runtime. Here is a diagram to help illustrate this. Any error which occurs within the SQL interface will generate a synchronous error. However, any error which occurs after a command group has been submitted will generate an asynchronous error within the SQL runtime. This is because once a command group is submitted, any error which occur may happen in another thread. Here we have the vector add example from the last lecture. In this version, we don't have any error handling, which means if an error does occur, the application will fail silently. Except perhaps a log to the console, but that's implementation defined. The first thing to do to handle errors is to wrap any SQL application code in a try catch block. This will catch any synchronous exceptions being thrown by the SQL API. Next, you must provide what's referred to as an async handler. An async handler is a callable, so a function object or lambda expression, which can receive asynchronous exceptions. This happens when you either call one of the queue's member functions, throw asynchronous or wait and throw. The reason for having an async handler is that when an exception is thrown by the SQL runtime, this is often in another thread, which means there's no way to communicate this to the user thread. So having a callable which can handle asynchronous exceptions invoked when the user calls one of the above functions, these exceptions can then be processed and potentially rethrown into the user thread. An async handler must take as a parameter an exception list. The exception list is a wrapper around a list of exception pointers, which can be iterated over. Exception pointers can then be rethrown by calling std rethrow exception. Once an exception, synchronous or asynchronous, is caught, it can then be used to provide information about the error. The what member function, just like for any exception, will provide a message with more details about the error that occurred, though the exact details of that message is implementation defined. If the exception has an OpenCL error code associated with it, this can also be retrieved by calling the getCLCode member function. If there is no OpenCL error code, then this will return CL success. Most exceptions will also have a context associated with them. The hasContextMember function will tell you whether there is a context associated with the error. Then, if this returns true, you can call the getContextMember function to retrieve that context. Finally, we're going to take a look at how to debug SQL kernel functions. As mentioned before, every SQL implementation must provide a host device. This means that SQL kernel functions can be debugged using a standard C++ debugger, such as GDB, LDB, or Visual Studio. To do this, you simply use the host selector when creating your queue, and kernel functions will run on the host device. It's as simple as that. So this concludes the lecture on SQL topology and creating queues. There should now be some time for us to answer any questions that you have on this.